Hello. <laughs> Having problems? <laughs> eh, no worries. It happens. Awesome. Okay. Pretty good. Am I, is this video? Am I able to be seen right now or no? Oh, thank God. I have no pants on. We, we can see you. <laughs> uh, <ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm doing pretty good. Having a having a halfway decent New Year. Getting getting some work done with um, Ash. And uh, yeah, I think over the course of this talk, I may have a, a little reveal. Actually, Sweet. I don't know if the uh, if the opportunity comes up to talk about it. I may I may talk about this thing. It might be Ash. It might be something else. Mm. I'm just I'm just being a jerk now. Yeah, intriguing. <laughs> mm. I I just said to my girlfriend earlier though, stick with what you're good at. It's advice to live by. <laughs> anyway, let's pass it around. Oh, it's uh, it's snowing over here, so we've been outside and enjoying it as much as possible. So it's it's been pretty good. Get, getting the twenty forty nine vibes big time today. Mm. Yeah. But... Yeah, we've heard snakes are uh, coming into your showers and whatnot. Is that true? Nice. Lucky. Oh, fun. And, and oh, not the terrible <laughs> ones, just regular ants, right? Wow. Like 2019 <laughs> ants? Like, are they actual ants? <laughs> Must be expensive. <laughs> <laughs> wow, high roller. <laughs> hmm, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, just rewatching Alien every other day, you know? It's just yeah, <laughs> the usual. Is there any other way to live? <laughs> I I haven't found it out. I, I think this either. is it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clara, how about you? What are you doing? 
Wow, a loaded question. <laughs> What's been new? Ah. Is uh is that the picture you just shared? Is that the one he commit he you had commissioned? Nice. Yeah, I've never seen an Archaeopteryx look so scary, but it looks amazing. <laughs> it's really cool. Hey, if there's somebody who's gonna do it right. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Damn. 37. Yeah, me too this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the big secret that, that Mike's been holding on to. Uh, so, you know, just watch over <laughs> your shoulder a little bit. <laughs> Shh. Everybody yeah. stop talking. <laughs> It's just a joke. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, here we are in 2019, and it's uh, the year that Blade Runner came out. And, or, well, takes place in, I should say. And we don't have flying cars quite yet. And we don't have androids, as far as we know, but there's been... I think that when you look around and you look at certain places around the world, it's very much the vision that Ridley Scott and the writers had um, in Blade Runner so many years ago. Um, and it's it's kind of incredible. And to have a movie that still holds up over all this time, and now almost looks like it had predicted certain parts of the future, it's... Um, it's pretty, it's wonderful, and at the same time, it's pretty scary because Blade Runner is in a very optimistic future, and now we're we're kind of living, we're living it in some way, um, and it's mm. only a matter of time until the the flying cars and the androids do show up, and then that's just going to com complicate everything. But even now, I think a lot of people have lost uh or are confused about who they are and where they belong in society and i think that fits very well with uh discussing blade runner at, uh continuously past its release date um it's it's important to everybody i think identity and um their place in society whether you're uh quote unquote real or not Um, well, I saw Blade Runner for the first time. I, I can't really exactly remember when the first time was, but I got really into it. Um, around the time I was 12, uh, 11, 12 years old, um, my dad and I watched it. It, it was kind of a go-to for a while. Um, my dad was getting really into Blade Runner for some reason around that time, and he was sculpting uh, these huge Rutger Hauer um, sculptures that he was going to do as um, uh, you know model kit type of things. He was going to paint them all up. So um, he's got a whole there's there's a whole bunch of Rutger Hauer heads. He was just like working and working and working on them, and they're like amazing. So um, I got really into Blade Runner myself just being around that. Um, 
11, 12 years old, I was starting to draw the characters and cityscapes and stuff like that. And um, the soundtrack just absolutely is the soundtrack of my life. That uh, Van, Van Gelis, uh soundtrack is, um, I think, probably one of the biggest reasons, that it, uh, biggest ways that it resonates in my life. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like I said, dominated my, my, my teen years and into my 20s. Um, from about 11, 12 years old. Nice. My my dad introduced me as well, and he he had bought the final cut, and he hadn't seen it in years. And we watched mm. it about you know five or six years ago. And I wasn't I was pretty reluctant because I had no idea what I was about to see. And then sure, it, you know it it hits you so hard when you see it. And uh, saying the soundtrack was such a big pull for me. It 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 transported you to another world. Oh my God! Yeah, it's it's timeless. Even though you know some of the sounds can would be considered a little dated now. I mean, the the composition is the composition and the actual performances and the music are just uh, they're so uh, emotionally immersive. You know, they you you mentally go there when you listen to that music. Um, it's really really affecting music. Um, for for film, you know, it's just one of the absolute best scores I think of all time that I've heard anyway. Mm. Well, for me, it's a very different story because um, I was allowed to watch Alien, but I wasn't allowed to watch Blade Runner, uh, so I completely missed most of that. I only got to watch it in 2017, believe it or not. Whoa. Yeah. So so for me, it was very immediate watching Blade Runner and then watching 2049. To, to me, those two movies Wait. are very much connected. So the first time you saw Blade Runner was 2017? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow and it, and it stands up to the test of time. And it's so weird to see sure, Harrison yeah. Ford so um so young in it. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had seen him in, you know, Indiana Jones and stuff like that. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, in, mm-hmm. in Blade Runner, he's like a baby. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what an experience that must have been, though. Seeing seeing those pretty much back to back, almost in that case, uh, you know, for the first time, getting to experience the first and second one together. I wonder what that experience would be like. Yeah, and I, I watched I watched the theatrical cut without the voiceover um, mm-hmm. because I wanted to experience it the same way that people originally experienced it. And then I watched, I think, all 11 different cuts over a... a, a, (laughs) But the the problem with doing that is that I can't differentiate between them all now. (laughs) Like, they're all kind of, like, muddled in my head. Yeah. (laughs) Well, a lot of them aren't even, like, too different from each other. The final cut is obviously very different, but, like, the international one, there isn't much difference between Mm. that and the regular theatrical US (laughs) one. And then it's like, oh, my God, I just, I can't put them together in my head yeah i i think i like the final cut the most that that was the last one i watched um and it was the most satisfying i don't know whether it was because it was the last one and i'd watched all of them and and it kind of made sense the most or or what but i I felt like it it did the most for the story yeah until they come out with like the final -er cut the (laughs) final the final cut point the The most finalist cut (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> none more final yeah i i really thought that they would come out with some sort of special um collector's set for this year for blade runner but mm. i think they came out with the best blu-rays and, and stuff last year because they had a um they had like a, a steel uh steel book collection and the the gun um oh wow and they, that was really good one. And they have, um, a while back, they released, like, the Voight Kampf suitcase. And it comes with, like, a oh, little car. Yeah. And, like, and all this stuff. And it's my, oh, my God. It's, like, $300. But <laughs> my dad's got that one, actually. Wow. Oh, man. So cool. Lucky. Yeah. So lucky. If I had the money. Oh. <laughs> Aliens are already yeah. expensive enough for me. Um, so it's it's kind of sad for me because um, it, you get all of this sort of talk in... Um, the fandom like because i've only just kind of joined the blade runner fandom is like oh you're not a fan you haven't been watching it since 82 um oh, i was like 
I was I was born in eighty two, man. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Um, I'm born in 95. I can't do that. Like, no matter how much you want me to. <laughs> but uh, I think about this movie um, just as often as I think about Alien, even though, like, okay, so I don't see um, Alien and Blade Runner uh, being in the same universe. I know that there's nods to each other, and I think there could be, like, this parallel universe where one where Wayland lives and he stops global warming and the other one where... Um, well, Terrell doesn't live, but, um, he, he doesn't get to stop global warming and, you know, they build the sea walls and stuff like that. So, so to me, like it kind of, it can kind of mesh in some ways, but not in others. What do you think about the shared universe theory, um, Hyperdyne when it comes to a Blade Runner and Alien? Incongruent because, um, Blade Runner 2019 they're already colonizing planets. Um, that's a huge um, jump from, you know, uh, Sir Peter Wayland, uh, Prometheus, talking about, you know, Eureka, the light bulb, and all that <laughs> stuff at the TED Talk. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they hadn't colonized anything at that point, and that's supposed to be, what, 2025 or something like that. I think, so yeah. So they don't work right there that's a huge thing right there where it's no they're separate universes and in this in the other really in in my mind uh, all that kind of stuff aside canonical stuff aside um there's no need for them to be in the same universe i don't understand what the point of that would be other than to just be like hey look at this Mm. <laughs> yeah, like what, what else, Like what purpose does it serve? I don't need to see Roy Batty and an alien going head to head, or God, Roy Batty and like an engineer or something. Like it's, it's totally stupid. I don't think there's any reason for it. I wouldn't mind anyway, seeing it in a comic, but I wouldn't want to see it on screen. That's for sure. Yeah, not not canonically. I don't yeah. think that makes sense really. And there's, it's just it seems extraneous to me. Um, mm. So yeah, I hope Mike doesn't have a totally different opinion that I'm basically. <laughs> saying well, that's stupid because uh, <laughs> i respect everybody's opinion officer well, joe what do you think <laughs> i mean us mike's got to stick together and i You're i completely right. I, I agree with you 100 percent. and um i i kind of look at it in the same way of uh the alien versus predator universe um it's it's cool but i don't think it has much to say uh and I, I don't know, I'm really big into just the movie's themes and, and the story more than I am action or, or violence or anything. And I think the only thing that Blade Runner and Alien together would do is exactly what Mike was saying is with, like, you know, oh, Roy Batty combat model, model versus an engineer or, a, or a, uh, an alien android, you know, or something like that. And it's I just don't think there's anything there. And, and in Prometheus, um, there's that Easter egg you can find on the the viral video page and it's peter whalen talking about how there's some guy who lived in a pyramid in the city of angels and it's like oh my god he's talking about blade runner and he's talking about tyrell oh are they connected and it, i think it's just a nod and it's just kind of an appreciation at how similar the two series are mm. and they both especially covenant and and prometheus have a, a they're closer to Blade Runner than any of the other Alien movies ever were, um, just because of the David, um, the David character, and the androids have become such a central part to Alien. I think it's kind of starting to blend a little more into the Blade Runner themes, and and I think that's what Ridley Scott mm -hmm. really wants to do anyway. Um, but as for them being together, I really, really, really hope they don't make a mistake like that. <laughs> I think it's kind of fun that uh, Prometheus and Covenant are kind of like a mixture of Blade Runner and, and Alien, um, but yeah, I, I donm don't, I don't see it working can canonically. Ha having worked on blending timelines and over different medias and stuff like that, you're right, it just it doesn't, doesn't make sense because like different things happen, but I think it's kind of cool that it could be maybe a parallel universe. Um, and, and the ideas are kind of very similar. To, to do with like creators and creation and and um what does it mean to be human and stuff like that and i guess like that's what the main mm -hmm. investigation of blade runner is because um yeah it asks the question 
um, what's the difference between a, a replicant and a human being? And if you can't tell the difference, then why does it matter? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's start off discussing um, characters. What do you think about uh, Terrell um, having been the, the head of a Terrell Corp and, and what his aim was because he he plays a pretty minor role in a movie like minor as in like he doesn't make much of an appearance apart from saying a couple of lines we're mainly following Deckard but what do you think about um Terrell and and his role in his created world and and what he does in the in the in the film one of the mics (laughs) go ahead Mike Mike. (laughs) Go ahead, buddy. Oh, okay. I will take the reins. Um, <laughs> I let's see. Well, Tyrell. I think if you were to compare him to other characters uh, of similar stature, so if we took a Peter Wayland or any of the Waylands that have appeared in the Alien films, I do think he actually wants. He has a a, a benevolent goal in mind. I don't think he's an evil man. Um, I don't even really think he's a villain, but mm. he he's doing what all people who attempt to create life do, and grow. He's grown into something that's that's dangerous, and he he sees uh, replicants as a commodity um, mm. when obviously they he shouldn't have. Uh, and I he kind of when Roy enters his his apartment or his I guess his mansion his house um he he looks like he kind of expected it he kind of he kind of sighs and it's like oh, okay well I, this was bound to happen sometime and he knows about roy and his exploits um, he even says actually i'm surprised you didn't come sooner yeah yeah exactly so, so he's he's prepared for this inevitability that either roy or one of the replicants who he knows are having emotional issues without uh, constructed memories, mm-hmm. um, they're going to come and, and they're going to demand that he explain himself or at least give them more chances to be alive. Um, so I think his only flaw is that uh, he becomes uh, enamored with creating life and he doesn't think about the consequences that that could have. And I think David is very similar in that way. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, Wallace, but uh, we'll talk about Wallace later with 2049. I, I do like that Tyrell has these massive goofy glasses. Um, <laughs> I think it's really it speaks a lot to him as like he is he is flawed himself. He's a flawed creator and he makes these perfect beings. Um, and maybe that has something to do with their their lifespan. Even though I know they say that to to deal with rebellions or to make sure that they don't develop their own emotional responses, they have these four year lifespans. But I don't know. I think it's kind of a flawed creator creating flaws in his creations, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he exhibits the, the, uh, his, you know, the, the mark of his lowly origins. Yes. Yeah. As, as they would say. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think that's about, that's what I've got on, t- on Tyrell. How about you, Hyperden? Well, um, I absolutely love Joe Turkle or Turkel, however you say it. Um, as Tyrell, I thought he's just such an interesting choice for um, for that character. He's a fun character. He's not in the movie very much, but boy, does he have a presence when he's around. You know, without even having to be this monumental guy or anything, he just has a, like a fantastic air to him. Uh, as as Tyrell, he always kind of reminded me of those like Raidue puppets. You ever see those puppets in the Italian? Like they're like these really exaggerated, grotesque newscasters, but they're puppets and they're <laughs> Italian. I think this was like in the '90s. He always kind of reminded me of one of those. Anyway, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I I uh, sorry I I just can't get over the uh, actor 
who played him. He was so much fun. I loved him as Tyrell. Um, man, I don't, other than that, um, we don't get a huge look at his psyche and inner workings. Other than that, um, you know, one of the first things he says to Deckard after initially addressing him is uh, commerce is their goal. Mm. And more human than human is their motto. And from that, I glean that, um, you know, yeah, commerce is his goal, but I think, you know, commerce is his, is still his means to his end. Like, like you said, um, that he's, you know, perhaps megalomaniacal and all that kind of stuff. We don't get a huge look at, at his, um, the inner workings though of why he does what he does you know mm -hmm. why he creates life um if he's the type of creator who does it just because he can or if he wants to create a race of supermen or um you know or if he's just utilitarian in it you know and this is something he sees as this is a product and i know how to deliver it and i'm genius enough to do it so um you know, this is my space in the world. Um, I go into a lot of detail with that in what I'm about to reveal, uh, which is a, uh, a Blade Runner short that I'm working on with my father. Wow, uh, as that's amazing. As a warm-up, yeah, it's gonna be great. Um, and it's a Blade Runner, it's a direct prequel to Blade Runner. Oh, man. Um, and it takes place maybe like a day or two before the film. It's a short because it's basically kind of a, a warm up to um, the Ash comic. So that'll be coming out, if all goes well, uh, that'll be coming out a month ahead of Ash. Wow. Wow. So I'm pretty <laughs> excited about that. And, That's uh, fantastic. Having my, having my father on board, wait till you see, he's been sending me uh, some work uh, and he's been illustrating some of the people from the comic I mean I, I'm sorry from the film um, and I, it's gonna be a great little piece it's it's only gonna be a couple pages but it's so cool oh, man. <laughs> I just finished writing the dialogue for it a few days ago wow that's so it's, exciting <laughs> it's gonna be so cool I cannot wait to put that out and uh, you know like I said it's something my dad introduced me to so I get to uh I get to work with my dad on it I wish he was here he could could have talked about it a little bit but um yeah but it's uh it centers on Tyrell and my take on his point of view of what he does so actually this yeah it's perfect uh, perfect time to talk about that actually yeah wow um, you are always so, doing like really cool stuff. <laughs> I wish I could do that. Yeah, <laughs> same. Like, what else? What else should we want to do with our lives, right? I just try <laughs> to do cool stuff as much as possible, all day long, <laughs> if I can. So. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm I'm excited. I'm I'm definitely going to look forward to sharing that on the Utani page too. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Maybe I'll give you dibs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Should be awesome. But yeah, Tyrell. I absolutely love that character. What well, do you think? Um, Roy mentions that he he's mentioning how to maybe increase the lifespan and expand it on, on Nexus 6s. And Tyrell says that he's already tried certain things. So was Tyrell actively trying to get around something that he had built as like maybe that fail safe that four year lifespan was so encoded into the replicants he couldn't find a way to get out of it. I think and he was Tyrell lying. Had a stake in it. You think he was lying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think, get a sense of that. I think that in in some cases he had encoded it and it works, and in some cases it doesn't, and that's why he kind of brought in the Blade Runners to kind of like try to hunt them down even before they expire because otherwise like you can just let them let them die you know <laughs> um, yeah I, I think he he wanted to kind of show that he is all-powerful and he didn't want any flaws in his creation to show through 
to show any sort of weakness on his part for his creation. Um, and I kind of felt the same way with uh, in, in the new movie um, as well with Wallace because um, he wanted to give the, the gift of um, procreation but he didn't want anyone else to find out that the, the replicants could start doing it on their own. Like they naturally uh, could do it. Otherwise he loses power, right? Um, so so yeah, that, that's my idea on, on why uh, he said that. But you know, it, it's kind of like it's up in the air. It's, you don't really know who's lying and who's who's not. Um, when it comes to uh, Terrell, I, I kind of see him as the the blind Norse god. Uh, uh, I think they called him Hodor or Hod. <laughs> Hodor. Hodor. Uh, yeah. Hodor. Huh? Yeah. So Hodor, um, he he kind of like let um, let his creations kind of run loose, and in, in a way, um, Roy Batty is kind of like Loki, the the mischief maker, um, and kind of enables him to to kind of just. He's not a very good creator. <laughs> he's kind of, he's, actually, yeah, I would say Terrell is more like Azathoth, like the blind idiot god. Um, <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> um, it's, it's just that kind of chaos reigns when he creates and it doesn't, there's no sense of order to anything. Like the, the or, order is an illusion and chaos is infinite if that makes any sense. Um, and, and that's the sort of view that I get when, when I'm um, watching the, the two movies, because I, I, to me, I can't separate them. They're very, um, very much tied together. Uh, hmm. But I, like I, I cool. think, I think the relationship between, um, uh, yeah, between Roy Batty and um, Terrell is like, Terrell kind of like created because he could and then kind of like let Roy and, and the rest of his team kind of rebel, but he was still under control. That that um f that freedom was an illusion. So hmm. so yeah, I think he's a a bit of a manipulator, but at the same time very hands off as a parent. <laughs> you don't you don't see him <laughs> heli so. helicoptering around uh, Roy and telling him what to do. He's kind of just like. He's, he was aware of his rebellion, but at the same time, just allowed it, you know? He, pro yeah. he probably wanted to see what would happen and how far his creations could actually go. Mm. Um, and I, I'm sure if he wanted it, Roy could have been caught in that elevator or or something. I don't know. It's It seems so easy for Roy to get in just by being in the elevator with J.F. Sebastian. Um, I just don't, I don't find Tyrell to be that kind of hubris you know um i find him more to be like i'm gonna die but i'm gonna die knowing that i've created true life that can decide if it loves me or not yeah that that's another thing um you can't force love and i think the first blade runner was very much about that um the love between uh the the created and the creator the love between two creations or 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 your creation and, and someone else's creation uh, for example um rachel and deckard um it's it's talking about artificial on so many different levels like artificial love or artificial beings and stuff like that yeah i find that very interesting what what, what do you think about yeah. the other replicants kind of um following roy on this crusade of his Personally, I just get the feeling they are, you know, they've made them, it's, you know, exactly as the, as the story goes, really, just that they, they all have this wish to, you know, live full lives, you know, for as far as they know, they are human. Mm. You know, their experience is as human as anyone else's. They have a head full of memories and a backlog of experiences and um, opinions informed by those memories that are implanted. So 
you know, their experience is as human as anyone else, as a naturally occurring human. So for them to want um, to experience more of that, you know, uh, as many moments as possible, um, you know, that's, uh, I think that's, that's really it. I don't, I don't see much more to it than that other than, you know, it's just that struggle, that same struggle. Mm. Officer Joe, what do you think? Well, I think at least one of the group still holds on to memories um, because Leon is heading back to his apartment to grab those photos before he realizes that the police are there. And Roy kind of taunts him about that and is like, oh, man, you're not really alive. You don't really understand what it is to be alive because you still care about something that isn't real. Um, mm, interesting. And I think... Chris is truly in love with Roy, and I think that they both do love each other. Um, and yet Roy is kind of the catalyst of all of their deaths, in a way. Um, he's convinced them to come and join him on this rebellion against their creator and to experience life. Um, and I think Roy understands this uh, only only when he's about to die and he understands like wow I I've wasted my life trying to get more of it when I should have appreciated what I had and mm. now I've lost everybody my friends and the person I love and <clears throat> the only thing I, I can do now is uh, prove to this killer that I'm alive I'm truly alive and I can I can prove it by saving his life and teaching him a thing or two and then dying and I feel I think I feel the most for uh, Zora, um, because her death scene is so uh, dramatic and and um, uh, I don't want to say romanticized, but it's it's uh, it feels like a play almost. Like you could see that happening in a play, and um, just when the whole group just starts disintegrating, it's I, I feel for the, for them. Even though even though they kill people, even though they're they're doing some pretty terrible things, it's. It's nothing worse than what humans were doing to each other, and um, yeah, I think I think Roy really uh, really started to understand that he he kind of caused their deaths in a way. Mm. I like that too. I think I think you're onto something there um, with that. You know, I never thought about it as as Roy having guilt over anything before until you mentioned that, and that definitely informs him saving Deckard in the end I think too um, you know it's like here's his last ditch effort to to save someone he can't save himself he's gotten his friends killed he's killed his creator both his creators um, he can save Deckard you know exactly. he does, and like you said he teaches him a couple lessons you know it's an experience to live in fear right so don't do that and Deckard then goes on to do to stop questioning, um, you know, his uh, his love with Rachel and everything, and goes on and says, you know what, I'm just gonna ride off into the sunset with this girl, even though Gaff left this quirky little unicorn near my house, and that's kind of freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> Not sure how I feel about that, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, unsolicited <laughs> origami. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think with that, without that, that guilt that Roy has in that turn I don't think there's really much to keep us caring about him other than that Red Grahauer is such an amazing actor um, mm, and I really yeah. feel that way with a lot of the characters in Blade Runner I don't attach to too many of them and I think the two that I do are Roy and Rachel and mm. it's and sometimes Deckard but Deckard's I don't know I, I have a lot to say about him but we'll wait until we it is to hard to feel for him though huh yeah I agree it's it's almost hard to feel for Deckard sometimes because and maybe it's just the performance is so subdued but mm -hmm. we don't get this huge look into Deckard's life or psychology maybe I'm just not looking deeply enough into it or um, you know not being not having watched it analytically enough recently but um I feel like God I can see why people were confused by the movie or Maybe not confused, but um, you know it wasn't received because it's one of those movies that you you need to watch it several times and marinate in it, you know. Yeah. Um, 
as as much as there is that's in, initially attractive about it, superficially attractive about it, man, there's there's a lot going on under the hood in that movie, and some of it is spearheaded in such a subtle way that it's like you don't get it until like the eleventh time you've seen it until it, 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 you know things are clicking and you're going, oh my god, so this is like part of the whole theme of the movie right here you know like mm. stuff that you know with an Avengers movie you're like you have eaten it all up you've gotten the taste and the flavor and you, you know everything is consumed within the first couple of viewings and then after that you're you know you're on to other things like Blade Runner is like even more of a slow burner than you know Alien but by a long shot you know there's just so much to consume I think in Blade Runner um, narratively Mm. That uh, you, you just don't get in one viewing. I really love the layered uh, filming of Ridley Scott's work because just there's just so much going on in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and on you know on revisiting the movie, I see more and more. Um, there's even stuff that um, Charles De La Zareka shared on Twitter um, about Blade Runner that I hadn't even spotted. Um, <laughs> that I was thinking like, oh God, could that be intentional that Ridley Scott is referencing that artwork? And if I just only watched Blade Runner, then I would be like, nah. <laughs> but now that I've watched Alien Covenant, I'm like, Ridley Scott is intentionally doing it. <laughs> there's, there's no, yeah. there's no yeah. maybe about it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I find interesting, um, about the movie. And I, I feel like. When, when you kind of take into account his whole catalogue of films he's done and, and more so to like the sci-fi stuff the, there is like he's he's got like ideas in his head and he just brings them out onto screen kind of like makes his movies living paintings which I really appreciate exactly yeah and Jordan um, Cronin was really helped with that too yeah, you yeah know, him absolutely. and Ridley working together my god that is the, like <laughs> ultimate cinematic dream team right there oh yeah, my god for sure <laughs> um for me when it comes to the replicants i actually felt more for um for zora and for uh or rachel as well um but but not so much because she kind of lived the sort of privileged life of a replicant because she was taken care of by eldon <laughs> until she got kicked out like I, I kind of liken that whole um, uh, that that whole scene with her being booted out is kind of like being Eve being booted out of heaven because she yeah, she knew exactly. too much, um, and yeah, I I kind of felt that she she got the the raw end of the stick then, but she lived such a really great life in comparison to. Uh, the other replicants who were kind of like um, used and abused and um, hold on, I just have to look up something. What what was the name of the club that um, Zora danced at? Uh, Taffy Lewis. Yeah, it was Taffy New Taffy Lewis is uh, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of like this. Uh, the whole um, sexualization of the replicants and, um, and and kind of like using them for war and stuff like that. It's it's all the, all the sort of stuff that is done to human beings as well. And I think that when when people go, oh, it doesn't matter. It's just a replicant. That's when I'm like, no, that's the point. That's the point that you're supposed to be thinking of them as lower mm -hmm. than human beings is because we've done this stuff to human beings. Does it, does it cease to be wrong? Um, and I've had some really full on, um, uh, discussions with people because they just simply don't feel for the replicants at all. And I'm like, going, really? What? Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> it is insane. Yeah. Agreed. It, to there's, me, it's just... there's people walking among us that don't identify like replicants as obvious stand-ins for human beings. Like that's yeah. the whole point. That they don't. It doesn't matter that they get abused or, or murdered or you know whatever because they're replicants. It shouldn't matter. Damn. And I'm like, yeah. Wow. It's just <laughs> right over there. It's an emotional system 
with wants and needs and memories, it operates and has the exact same external results as a human mind. Mm. So in the end, you're best to treat it like it's, <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if you're confused, you're better off treating it as if it's a living thing. Yeah. Because, you know, it's it, sentience, you know, as we're learning uh, slowly, you know, we're approaching sentient computers quickly. Mm. We're getting, you know, certain places, Boston Dynamics, I think, are, wait, no, they're more robotics than AI, but... Um, it's surprising. The um, the sex doll industry is probably the one who's probably closest on the verge to having the most human reaction. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but it's true. The ones where the robots are going to be abused the worst. Yeah, <laughs> and they're putting AIs into them so that the AIs could learn what their human counterparts want from them. Um, and oh. I was going to say, I, I relate the most to Pris. <laughs> Because I've been uh, used and abused horribly by both men and women, and it's disgusting. But uh, I sympathize with her the most because for her, that's her purpose built. She doesn't know any different. So it doesn't surprise me that she wants to choke the living shit out of Deckard um, mm. because of what happened and uh, everything that's happening to the replicants. She's kind of like the representation of... Um, of karma, <laughs> the the, mm. the physical representation of karma, um, born on the screen for this story. Um, so yeah, my 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 deep connection would probably be with the girls. So Pris, Zora, and Rachel. Mm. Yeah. Um, wh what about the Blade Runner universe? Do you appreciate about the technology? How well their vid phones work. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. <laughs> yes, I wish my vid phone worked. God damn it. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. And the, and the printers <laughs> seem to work better as well. I don't know why, but printers... Which ones? What is? <laughs> the, um... The, uh, the, the, the Esper machine, right? Yes, Esper the, analysis? Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're Zo Polaroids. Yeah. yeah, zooming into things. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd love that technology. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the Blade Runner game that came out in, I want to say, nineteen ninety seven. Um, it was it it was this point and click detective game, and you played like a rookie Blade Runner, uh, d doing stuff um, and looking for other replicants at the same time that Deckard was looking for uh, his group. And they have um, they have the Esper machine in it, and any photos you find through security cameras or on the ground or whatever, you can put in there, and you can yourself go through and zoom in on parts of the picture and find out clues that you can use later on. Wow, um, that's cool. It's really mm -hmm. cool, and it's something I think would be really fun to mess with today. Um, to like look behind walls and zoom around in a 3D environment through a picture. Um, I think that would almost be like reliving a memory more than anything. Um, maybe that's why they included it. I don't know. Because you, you only get that one angle right now, but if you could if you could just like look around at what you were seeing and what other people were doing around you, um, that'd be as close as we could get to living a memory. It'd be really cool. Who was the guy behind the grassy knoll? Let's find out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We could fix history. We could figure it out. <laughs> it'd be so awesome. Ooh, but Seriously, butterfly yeah. effect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really liked that like <clears throat> okay <clears throat> I'm gonna go slightly off tangent here I, I really liked about um, Ghost in the Shell there was a scene where they jacked into the um, one of the geishas and they, they could recreate what the geisha was experiencing and, and saw and you could walk through this 3D environment it could only happen with Major who who is uh, part robot part human um, but that's really cool and I, I, I think it kind of takes from that idea in Blade Runner um, I think Ghost in the Shell is very heavily influenced by Blade Runner so it's um, it's really interesting like, kind of like homages and nods in, in sci-fi what other pieces of science fiction uh, have you 
like red watched or experienced that kind of um, takes from Blade Runner? Can you think of any? I know I can. Um, actually, my buddy um, Stephen Scott, uh, pen name Scott Duvall, he uh, worked on a comic book, a graphic novel sequel. He actually wrote it with the creator of the film uh, called Narcopolis, which is, man, you want to, like, before Blade Runner 2049 came out, if you needed your Blade Runner fix, mm-hmm. Narcopolis. It was a uh, an English film. Uh, I can't remember the the writer's name at now off the top of my head, but um, this was on Netflix, I believe, for a little while. If it isn't anymore, um, and it's it's definitely worth looking up and checking out. I know. Um, boy, I'm I'm blanking on names here. Uh, the guy from Game of Thrones, uh, Khaleesi's brother is in it oh um, right and uh I, I don't know his name but uh yeah that was a really fun uh you know dystopian future uh film and definitely you will instantly see you know the effects of Blade Runner and and to pretty pretty nice effect you know um you know heavy heavy on the influence of Blade Runner but it definitely has its own you know, makes its own statements, has its own uh, life to it, mm. you know, uh, narratively and and everything. Uh, it's not about robots or anything, and uh, definitely check that out. If you're a Blade Runner fan, you will enjoy that one awesome. and the comic. <laughs> <laughs> I just included a link to it on um, our Facebook Live, awesome. Narc- Narcopolis. It came out in 2015. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I have just a few. I think, mo- oh, I don't know. So many movies I love take their influence from Blade Runner, and it really was the the movie that started the whole cyberpunk big mega city um, trend. I guess you could call that. So you know, Total Recall, um, uh, Children of Men. Uh, I think oh Akira was something I watched just because I like Blade Runner, and I ended up loving it by itself. <laughs> um, that was so so amazing. Ghost in the Shell we already talked about. Um, I think Gattaca has similarities to it of like a future where you can oh, kind yeah. of going off world the, and stuff. Yeah, and the perfect humans and and messing with the genes and stuff like that. Um, the, in terms of video games, um, there's one that I played a bit of called Snatcher, um, and it's it was made by Konami, so they make you know uh, Metal Gear and um, that entire series of games. And Snatcher is another point-and-click game uh, that you... <laughs> it's basically Blade Runner. Even the, the main character looks like it. But there are these uh, things called Snatchers, and they're replacing people all over the world. Um, and you have to figure out who and who isn't a Snatcher. And you have help from a little robot buddy, and it's just... It's very, very cool. has a really sweet soundtrack, too. So um, if you guys can play it at all, I definitely recommend it. Awesome. Mm. You know, one thing that I've, um, since we're going from film into comic books and um, video games, one thing that I was really surprised to capture the feeling of Blade Runner, and they said it was highly influenced by the aesthetic in Blade Runner, was A Perfect Circle's first album. And boy, does that evoke the feeling of Blade Runner and Alien, like early Ridley Scott it's like if you could turn those two movies into music that didn't sound like music from the movies this is what it would sound like the the first wow. uh, um, A Perfect Circle album uh, Mare de Gnomes absolutely has the feeling of Blade Runner and Alien I think in the first song on that it's called The Hollow one of the very first lines in the first song is run run desire run run him like a blade (laughs) and I was like was that on purpose and uh, I read later on the guitarist the guy who you know wrote all the music um, Billy Howard L said he was completely influenced by uh, David Fincher and Ridley Scott I guess uh, in 
you know the compositions of the songs and soundscapes he was creating boy was it effective because i obsessed over that album for a long time wow that's wow. awesome <laughs> yeah definitely check that out yeah, yeah i think i will cool. yeah you'll you'll probably recognize it at this point it's uh guys 20 years old this year Damn. so you'll know it's the singer from tool and all that kind of stuff so but anyway oh, yeah um, out of the like out of the whole film in Blade Runner, what what would you say is the most standout scene for you? Ah, oh, uh, you go ahead first. I I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's really tough, huh? That's a tough question because in a movie that's so visually stunning, you you immediately think like. It, it has that overload of being in Times Square, you know, or a busy, crowded city street with lots going on. Like, the whole movie has that effect, even the, the calm, quiet parts, because, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Ridley Scott. So, mm -hmm. um, but for me, I think my favorite thing, I'm probably going back to when I was 11, 12, is just that first shot, that first opening shot. Um, I wanted to go there so bad as a kid. I just wanted to go in a spinner and fly over everything and just land somewhere and go into a club. <laughs> just like call up a girl on a vid phone and go get like, you know, Mr. Chow's or whatever, you know. Um, it's just, I wanted to like live there so bad. And it's crazy because now I am right now this moment i'm in like a building downtown in seattle it's really rainy and snowy out and kind of foggy it's 2019 and like i'm pretty much i just realized it recently i'm like i'm kind of living about as close to that life as i possibly could right now <laughs> without living in hong kong or something yeah um you know and it's it's pretty cool it's like uh it's a small tr dream achieved for me to feel like I'm kind of living in that first shot of Blade Runner right now. Pretty awesome. So I think it's probably probably the first shot to fly over for me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, <laughs> a good, that's, a, that's a good answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, do, do you live in Seattle, by the way? I do, yep. Nice. I'm up in Bellingham, actually, so I, I oh, had no, no idea. Hey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we could have gotten together and done this. That would have been badass. Yeah, we got to think <laughs> about hands. that. <laughs> well, we're mics. We just do that anyway. That's great. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there's a meeting on Thursday. Don't yeah. forget. <laughs> um, I think, I think if I had to pick one scene besides uh, Roy Batty's death, because you know everybody mm. picks that one <laughs> usually. Um, I think what resonated with me was when Deckard started investigating um, uh, Zora's location so um when he when the camera pans down on the city streets and he's talking to the lady about the scale um and if it's fish or snake or whatever and and the music the cue that always repeats kind of in that first half of the movie is this um arabic sounding language uh and it's kind of floaty and in the background and i know it was a friend of van gallis's who was also a greek who did the um the vocalizations for that and i always thought it was a woman and apparently it isn't um and it's just it's beautiful it's absolutely beautiful and i don't even think it's a real language but it sounds amazing um mm. and when he when he's going around the animal uh animal animoid row as the as it's uh, shown in the soundtrack uh and there's all the animals and the the hawk flies right by his head and it, it just feels so um real in that moment uh and and that continues on into the bar and when he's when he's doing his uh, fake voice at um, at Taffy Lewis's, it's one of the <laughs> the best scenes in the movie. Um, so I think that whole sequence of just the investigating and retiring Zora is probably the best for me. Um, it feels the most real and uh, really puts you into the movie, into the world. Mm. Um. Oh, for me. It's, yeah, I was going to say the Zora chase scene, but I was just thinking about um, uh, <laughs> when, when they go um, visit the eye guy. I only do eyes. 
Um, <laughs> I thought that was really cool because you get to see it's it's very different from every other scene in the movie. You're kind of in this refrigerator, and you get to see the characters dressing in a different way, interacting with their environment in a different way, um, the technology as well. So so yeah, I think I think for me, it would be that scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's mm. just very unserious scene as well. <laughs> it's unsettling yeah. too, like putting the eyes on his shoulder and he's slowly freezing and ah, it was creepy. <laughs> it <got> creepy <laughs> yep, totally my thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> what do you think about uh... Roy's got a thing with eyes too? Yeah. I'm so happy you found uh, us. Like. <laughs> <laughs> If only you could see what I've seen with your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And and the close up of the eye at the beginning of um the film as well. That that's a really nice scene as well. Um not knowing whose Big eyes brother. they are. Mm. Who's watching. <laughs> um I was also thinking of the fashion in um this Blade Runner film. Like I know we've we've had kind of like another another film that kind of takes a lot from Blade Runner is The Fifth Element, which I really enjoy. Um, it's got the flying cars as well, and and um, the police force being in like really futuristic sort of outfits. The sort of interaction between human beings and technology, and how we kind of like deal with it being uh, kind of uh, faulty, like still hitting things <laughs> to make them work. Stuff like that. Um, but uh, what, what do you think about the fashion? Um, how do you think it has fared between uh, Blade Runner and, and 2019 fashion now? Well, personally, I think uh, Ridley Scott was uh, pretty accurate in saying that uh, they moved fashion forward with Blade Runner, actually. And... Um, you know, Blade Runner's fashion immediately, uh, you know, it took from what punk was doing and New Wave and all that um, and, you know, turned a lot of it, a lot of those concepts on their heads. And, uh, you know, Blade Runner doesn't actually try to make a prediction. It's it's meant to be entertainment. But, um, you know, like they predicted the immediate they didn't predict never mind it, they influenced the immediate uh style because you know as ridley loves to say you know you saw the punk coming out and the grunge and blah, 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 like <laughs> uh in the videos and stuff throughout the 80s yeah blade runner was like you see it more and more over the few years after that and um you know i mean everything nowadays is an extrapolation of that in seattle particularly um, you know, kind of anything goes style-wise. I notice with uh, people, it's just, you know, whatever you want to do is going to, it'll fly here. <laughs> you know, up to and including wearing nothing. So, um, That's very accurate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, really, I, I would say Blade Runner had a, a more immediate effect um, uh, influence on fat in the fashion world, definitely. Uh, yeah, um, I think just like The Matrix and how people kind of started wearing all black and trench coats and whatnot for a short time, I think Blade Runner probably influenced influenced it somewhat. Um, in terms of the Ridley Scott's punk comments, I, I don't know, man. Ridley Scott's kind of a... I really like him. I really do. But like, he just says stuff sometimes, and I don't know why. Because <laughs> I think, if anything, music and like the artists for said music influenced people in Britain or in the US and the punk genre more than more than one movie did and especially during the time it came out too like I, I don't know I don't know if it's had that big of an effect but I'm also kind of uninformed on the subject so I could be wrong <laughs> but I think look at, looking at people today it's it's very much understandable why people would say that because like Mike said that in Seattle, people do just wear whatever they want. In Portland, in Bellingham, anywhere, uh, often on the West Coast, I found uh, people kind of just mm. 
go with the flow and wear what they want. And Blade Runner and its sequel definitely show people doing that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's because of Blade Runner. <laughs> I did that. Or because of me, yes. 